What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we have Jeff Morris Jr., who's the managing partner at the Venture Fund Chapter One. I'm extremely excited to have Jeff on. I've been following him for a long time. Uh, right now, he's investing, um, doing a lot in the crypto space and also just tech in general. Um, but before that, he was the VP of product and revenue at Tinder. Um, and that's when Tinder didn't really have their premium tiers yet. And he led that effort. And he led Tinder to become the number one grossing app in the app store, going from 20 million in ARR, annual recurring revenue, to 1.2 billion. Um, so pretty absolutely incredible. Jeff, welcome to the show. Yeah, excited to be here. I've I've seen Mert and, and you launch the show and really uh, a big fan. So this will be fun. Amazing. Well, I'm glad to have you. I think it's impossible for me to have this conversation with you and not talk about Tinder and some of the learnings you have from there. I think what's really awesome about having you here is that one thing crypto doesn't focus on much is products. It's, it's all about infrastructure, which is important, <laughs> but you come from that product background, right? And you actually understand um, like what users want. But before we get into that, you're pretty, you're a prolific writer. And your last essay that you did was called Venture Narrative Whiplash. Um, and you said that's uh, it's a term that I think you coined, but you said it's something that's shaped our industry more than anything else you've seen in the last 10 years. So I was hoping you could just introduce that concept to the audience and, and how it applies to the market today. Yeah, it's a new uh, idea I've been thinking about, but it's basically this idea. Um, so the, the entire industry lives on Twitter, crypto and venture capital. And so um, in an era of trying to build audiences, the best way to do so is through mostly like negativity and um, because that gets most engagement. And so you see this um, cycle every couple months of, like a new venture narrative as to what's popular hit the mainstream. And the implications of that are, um, I kind of mapped it through limited partners who invest in venture funds, obviously venture funds, and then founders who are building companies. And it has a really profound impact on what gets built. And I think it's actually a new ph phenomenon because like I entered tech in 2010. And we were all on Twitter, but it wasn't as cutthroat in terms of trying to um, flex online and be right about um, what's next in your thesis. And it was a lot more collaborative. And so I've seen this with, with crypto. If you think about a year and a half ago, um, which isn't that long ago in like building time, the entire industry was very excited about blockchain technologies, digital assets, um, and the conversations were more excitement around the technology. And now if you go to any venture capital dinner or conference outside of crypto, um, they kind of treat you like you're like, you're like doing something wrong by being excited about crypto still. Like, it's like, oh, you're still doing crypto or you're still excited about digital assets and you have to almost like defend yourself, which I think is a very weird place to be in a 500 day cycle within a early stage technology market. And, um, so the point was like, everybody's being pushed to specialize, um, uh, founders and investors in given markets and the reality of trying to survive any multi-year period within any sector. So it could be crypto, it could be, I'm seeing the same thing in AI now, where everybody's now gone to AI and suddenly like the early, there's, there's, there's new narratives emerging that that whole space is going to be a disaster for VCs, which it very well might be the case, but it ends up being, um, a negative, that's a negative impact on what gets, what gets built. And it's kind of a bummer. Um, and so I'm trying to, trying to, to communicate like we um, should all give ourselves more time to build the products that we hope to bring to market. And um, I wish that the ecosystem as a whole took a more patient view as to what um, the outcome of any given sector might be. And so I feel bad for founders in, in the crypto space right now because the impact of all this, this venture narrative whip, whiplash is it's nearly impossible to raise a series a right now if you're doing anything crypto related um and most of these founders have really great intentions and so um anyways that's a, that's the idea and it's it's a new idea and 
Um, the last part is I think it's almost like applying cancel culture to entire sectors, which is very um, crazy to me that you can just like the industry as a whole can just cancel an entire sector together. And we're all in agreement um, when that happens. And I, I think, um, again, that's kind of the, the idea there. That's very interesting, the cancel culture part about uh, entire industries. You did mention something interesting there, which is that, you know, even if you're a really well-intentioned crypto founder today and you have a you know good product and maybe good good traction, you it's, it's still going to be very difficult for you to raise a Series A and maybe continue the business and, you know, grow, grow the market. What do you think will help us overcome that? Like, what, will it just take, you know, a few breakout products? Will it take a new bull cycle? Um, like, what would your advice to crypto founders be? Yeah, I think there's never like one silver bullet, but Mer, I think your instincts are right that, that any bull market overnight changes the narrative within the venture ecosystem and makes people excited again, which is unfortunate because the bull market often isn't related to the underlying principles of what, what are being built or um, kind of like the ground level truth of what's being built, rarely it is. Uh, I would say to get to the next milestone as a, as a founder, a big very much depends on what you're building. So if you're building a protocol, the go to market and the fundraising sequencing is much different than something that resembles B two B SaaS, um, where you're selling to Web three startups or enterprises. And I find the teams that are most impacted right now tend to be the more like the B two B business models because the web three market is just very um small as of today so if you get to a million arr or whatever it might be it's very hard to go from like one to five to 20 and to keep hitting those milestones um we've seen some examples of that with you know like quick note or um other folks like that who've been able to, to kind of like cross over to the um more like mainstream enterprise buyers but it's a small subset of companies and so um my Advice is always to do as much as you can to control your own destiny by um, having real end user adoption and trying to, to find what I, I call crypto market fit has been what I've called in the past, but like really challenging yourself to get traction, which is always the easiest way to get investment interests. And I, I, I see a lot of founders right now who um, unfortunately don't realize that having like 10 10,000 ARR it just isn't enough um and you have i think you have like founders who haven't seen kind of like what a series a a tough series a market looks like um unfortunately you you just mentioned protocols um given your background in like product and revenue protocol development and maybe products based on protocols so like i think you mentioned farcaster in one of your writings before they're kind of a new beast that isn't really familiar in the Web2 world. Um, so I'm curious, like, what is your um, like mental framework for understanding protocols and how protocols can monetize? Um, like, how do you think about them? Yeah, I think conceptually, protocols are most similar in Web2 to open source software, where you um, allow the community to build on top of um, whatever it is your your core project is. So in the case of Farcaster, I've um, spent a lot of time thinking about the Web2 business model being so focused primarily on ad, ad-based business models where your entire goal is to capture as much scale as you can and control that user base um, through walled gardens. And it ends up leading to, I think, subpar product experiences because you um you make a lot of decisions along the way that don't benefit the user which um if you've been in those rooms like it's a very different way of building products and so and i did that for a long time and 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 know kind of how those those product teams think what got me excited about farcaster as an example was just the idea that dan could build the core Farcaster protocol, and you you could have um, many different iterations of 
whatever that end user experience might look like based on different subsets of audiences that might have very different tastes. And so you could have a Farcaster India that functioned and looked a lot different than Farcaster US for crypto native audiences. You, you can really build, I think, better products for users if you take the product, the protocol approach. The challenges we're seeing is just, it's hard to get people to care about um, new social apps and especially in a bear market to get them to care about, um, you know, the decentralized version of whatever it is they're used to in the web two world. It, it's just hard to, to kind of like capture mainstream interest, but we're seeing, I think probably the, I've said to a lot of, um, limited partners who invest in venture funds that there is a, a world where Twitter no longer exists in a couple of years. And I was saying that like a year or two ago. And people looked at me like I was crazy. And now you, you, can, you can imagine Twitter as a business actually no longer being a product in a few years um, if they're not able to, to build a business. Like the ad, the ad revenue is, is falling off dramatically right now and they're not converting subscribers. And so um, anyways, I think, I, think, I think there's interesting um, reasons why a protocol might emerge that would replace a Twitter over the next couple of years. Yeah. You mentioned subscriptions there. I'm curious. It's a bit tangential to crypto probably because there's not a lot of subscription products that are, you might call native to crypto, like protocols are like you pay as you use it. One thing you said about, about Twitter as well is that if you were in charge of the product today, you might make that completely for subscribers, like a complete subscription product. So maybe, maybe you could just explain that because I'm curious, like what that, why, why you say that in the subscription business model in general. Yeah, so when, when Tinder was really um, like popping off, the, uh, a lot of the attention, for better or worse, like I was one of the people who was, who was getting a lot of the like public kudos for it and actually flew up to Twitter in 2018 and met with their, uh, a member of their product team, a senior member, and he said they would never do anything subscriptions related because Jack Dorsey just like, fundamentally didn't believe in subscriptions because you believe in open information. And, um, if you had a paywall to any product, obviously it's no longer completely open. The, um, truth in subscriptions, I think are a great way to hold yourself accountable to your subscribers to keep adding consistent value. If you, if your product gets worse, or you don't innovate, you'll see churn. And so there's this, um, binding relationship between you and the end user that you have to continuously add value. And I think that's um, a really great relationship to have with an audience. And so I've always thought that subscriptions were just a very, um, one, it's a, it's a great business model because you can predict your revenue and you can really have um, a consumer business that feels like a SaaS business, which is nice. Like that helps you sleep at night. And then two, I think um, the opportunity to, to continue to provide value for users and having them uh, recommit on a monthly or annual basis to whatever your your product is, I think that's a really great relationship to build community. Um, obviously, I think there's there's that new business models which are interesting. I think one of the challenges with crypto is you have um, you don't really have recurring payments and you don't have so you see a lot of like front loaded value in um, projects that don't continuously deliver value to their communities. And when they do, um, I think the expectations are just a lot different. So you have maybe like the web three version would be like token holders by holding your token are subscribing to your product every day when they wake up in the morning, choose to hold on to that asset. But um, there's, I find web three communities are a lot immersed probably has things to they're just like a lot more aggressive than web two end users and so um when you don't deliver in web three you really um you you really face a lot of, of of public scrutiny and i think for anyone launching a token um the the moment you launch a token you're beholden to a community that all have very different goals for what um kind of what what your product should should look like and 
Um, a lot of it's directly related to the price of the token, unfortunately. And so I've talked to founders who've launched tokens and um, like they've had like really dark moments after launching a token because it's just like a very hard life as a founder to um, to wake up to every day. So two questions. One is, do you differentiate when you talk about like tokens as maybe as a Web3 parallel to subscriptions? Do you differentiate between like fungible tokens and NFTs? Because obviously they have interestingly different dynamics based on the JPEG that's attached. But um, so that's number one. And number two, is it, do you think there's like a right way to do tokens, like maybe for incentivizing early users or um, using it as a way to like start like flywheel effects? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think what I was, one of the reasons why I found crypto to be exciting originally was from a growth a, a growth background, bootstrapping a network when you have tokens is such a powerful go-to-market. Like it makes Uber famously bootstrapped on like the give five, get five idea where you, for every friend you refer, you earn $5 that you can use for a future ride. Tokens make that feel like antiquated almost like, like it's like a color TV compared to a black and white TV. Like you get, you know, $5 to ask your friend to join Uber. And that's kind of all you get as an end user. That feels, um, pretty underwhelming compared to some of the rewards I've seen in web three. That said, I think the bar, which obviously we haven't fully figured out is just the sustainability of a, um, that kind of like bootstrapping mechanism has been hard to figure out. And so we have these waves of excitement, um, where you see just like crazy top line growth and, um, a project falls off a couple weeks later. I think we're seeing that data with, with, with friend tech probably recently. Um, but yeah, I, I think I do think of, um, of NFTs as being a, a we've seen good examples of this, um, particularly with, um, you know, like the early. 2001 vintage of NFTs. I think that was an interesting time where you did have this like real community element where people felt like they're subscribing to community and really felt um, an affinity towards those communities. I don't know now if people, those communities really care. I mean, if you look at a lot of the data, unfortunately, I think, um, again, people probably had very different goals, but it seems like a lot of the um, 2021 NFT communities have, have, have fallen off um, over the past year. Yeah, and, and that has to do with retention, right? Which I know in like Web2 is something that you look at probably every day, like you look at your customer churn. How do you, what, what metrics do you look at when you're investing in protocols and you look at the health of an ecosystem um, Yeah, in crypto? Because I know it's, it's much more difficult than in Web2 because one, you don't have a unique identity you can track. Like you have wallets and identities that might be you know, spread out across like in different um, IDs. So I'm curious, yeah, what, what metrics are you tracking to look for the health of an ecosystem or a token? Yeah, it's a little bit of a cop out, but we, we invest in like mostly pre products, so pre seed and seed investing, and we don't have a liquid fund that we, um, so most of the projects we invest in are pre launch. The, um, this like Web3 identity problem, I think, is something that. Um, we've tried to invest in projects who can help solve that. So one example would be Spindle, who's focusing on unifying wallet IDs and providing a clear view of, um, of kind of what the customer journey looks like from acquisition through any on-chain trading activity. We don't use that in our underwriting. So it's, um, it would be disingenuous to say that we do, uh, but we do spend a lot of time on um, doing analytics. We have a full-time data science on our team, Jamison Seidel, who um, also tries to to kind of identify um, what kind of the monthly, we look at unique wallets and try and try and make sense of it, but um, she'll look at, at kind of like the distribution of whales versus non-whales and trying to figure out one big thing is now just like how dependent are you on a small subset of users because I think it's very scary as an investor if you have a project that has like 50 people who control the entire fate of the community and so we try to look for some distribution that um, gives us confidence that there's a real community and not just like you know a small subset of people who can flip on the project and 
kill it overnight. Um, so it's tough. I think the narratives back to the venture narrative whiplash, you could probably apply that within crypto and say it's like a hundred X harder because the crypto community has their own, um, like the whiplash is just way more violent in crypto and happens overnight, um, in some cases. And so we want to get to know the founders too, and really understand their intentions for building a project because we find, um, it's really easy for people to, uh, to take a shorter term view on, on company building within crypto as well. And so, um, but we, we haven't seen back to the NFT projects. Like we haven't seen a lot of people build products post, um, launch. So I always thought like, I was in a group time where we talked about loot the other day as an example, um, like I always expected loot or board apes or any of these projects to have like real products like mobile experiences or web experiences that you could like actually log into. I know, I know a lot of them had like metaverse or gaming pitches within those, um, releases, but we haven't seen like, there isn't like an NFT project where you like wake up in the day and you log into your idea and you like do something. Um, in that community. And that's pretty surprising to me with all the dollars that have flown in or have gone into NFT projects that we haven't like, I kind of wonder like, what are these teams doing? Um, <laughs> like is anyone building software? Um, and if they're not like, what's the roadmap? Because I would, I would hope that some, um, people would view these as being like true social platforms that they could build really cool experiences on top of. Here, after the show, we can add the uh, we don't do that here meme when uh, Jeff asked about. <laughs> Sounds um, good. One, um, one thing that actually that reminds me of is so you, you actually talked about before, before um, Garrett's question about the unsustainability of the token so far. And, you know, presumably some of that is due to no teams other than like a very small handful finding PMF. Um, and you actually just mentioned that, you know, most of the NFT teams actually aren't even building products. Hey everyone, we'll get back to the show in a minute, but I want to let you know that we've got our permissionless conference coming up. This is our conference with Bankless. That's the biggest and best conference in DeFi. It's going to be in Austin, Texas this year. Yep. I know you love it. They got tacos, barbecue, Barton Springs. We got it all. September 11th through the 13th. If you've been in crypto for a while. You know that the bear market conferences are the best conferences because those are the ones where all the alphas had. The people that are still in crypto all really want to be there. It's going to be great for building a network, for learning a lot. And look, we've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers that include people like Hasu, Stani, Christine Moy, and Kyle Samani. Talking about ZK Tech, rollups, account abstraction, MEV, app chains, and more. Look, I'm damn excited. Because you're a listener of Lightspeed, you're going to get a special discount. Type in discount code Lightspeed30 and you'll get 30% off your ticket. That's right. Just type in Lightspeed30 when buying a permissionless ticket and get 30% off. Click the link at the bottom of this episode and go get it now because prices are going up every two weeks. All right, back to the show. You talked about this before in, in, in a Substack post. You you, you think that there might be a different way of thinking about this, which is crypto market fit instead of product market fit. Can you talk a bit about what that means for people who are unfamiliar and um, why, you know, um, you, you, you proposed it? Yeah, sure. So I think we get a lot of questions around from our investors, but also peers around like, does anything in crypto have product market fit? And so I wanted to answer that question in a way that um, looked at web three a little bit differently. And I think in any use case that it is financialized, the barrier to entry is greater to having like large populations join your product, but the, um, ARPU, the average revenue per user, or the ability to monetize that smaller base of users is much greater. And so the idea was, um, you know, in web two, like the goal was always to build the biggest network possible and then figure out how to monetize them later. The benefit of web three is everything is very monetizable. It's one of the reasons why I actually think the space is really interesting as an investor. Um, being if you, if you have a small subset of users that are active traders, like there's very easy ways to build a business. And so I looked at, um, 
in this specific instance, just looked at Uniswap trading volume, which this was in Q2 22. And the monthly trading volume was, was over $170 billion with 400,000 monthly traders. And so you can see, and then I compare that to Coinbase, which had a little over $200 billion of volume with 9 million monthly traders. And so 9 million versus for the centralized version versus 400,000 for the decentralized version with almost equal trading volume. And so maybe you could argue that those both have product market fit. But if you were to show this, um, if you were to like go on a public roadshow and try and take Uniswap public as a company, which you, you would ever do it and explain the fact that you had 400,000 users to a bunch of people in the public markets, they'd be like, this isn't an interesting business. Um, but it is an, it's clearly an interesting business. And so um, trying to reorient teams around the fact that you don't need like, I think the common trope in crypto is like, you know, bringing a billion users on chain or whatever it is. And maybe that's actually the wrong goal. Like maybe if we had 30 million people who were really passionate about crypto and found value in the ecosystem, that would be enough to build a multi-trillion dollar asset class that um, was great for founders and investors and LPs. And so, but I think a lot, some people responded to the article and said, um, like you're, it was basically like you're giving like Web3 builders like an easy path to claim that they have product market fit or like stop giving people an excuse to not um, be ambitious enough to compete with Web2. And I kind of um, uh, don't think, I personally, one, I don't like like Web2 versus Web3 debates, but I also think that um, we have to always like look at the positives in Web3 because it's, um, if you don't take time to look at the data and find optimism you'll frankly like get so depressed you'd want to leave the space probably so um, i spend a lot of my time like looking for like signals of po positivity or hope because i think it's really important in a bear market to say like things aren't as bad as everybody thinks um and i don't know if you guys know jeff lewis he's a investor at bedrock but he he's famous for like these narrative violations which is um his whole thing and he had a tweet recently. It was like, but like there's a narrative violation right now, which is crypto in less than 10 years became a trillion dollar asset class. And so like, clearly this is a valuable space and like, it's not just like a complete zero. Um, but it's almost a narrative violation to say that, that you believe in crypto right now, which is, it's, you know, pretty, pretty wild to, to think. 100% agree. It is interesting. That's kind of a blessing and a curse that in crypto you can have fewer users. But like, I like that you were comparing Uniswap to Coinbase, but they had like 70% of the transaction volume. But you were also talking about earlier how when you have a few users who are contributing to that volume, you can also lose those. You're dependent on a small subset of users. Um, so it's kind of yeah. scary in some sense. Um, I'm curious, just obviously you're, you've, you're staying in the space. Your fund doesn't only invest in crypto. I think maybe the first one did, but I know you're in crypto and also outside of it. What are some small things crypto could do or products you're looking for that are just missing from the space? Um, and maybe we don't get into this yet, but I do want people, I, again, I just don't think there's a lot of product people in crypto and they're missing some potentially really small things. Like Curve used to get praised for its website and how complicated it looked, which was great for engineers, but like if you really want to get yeah. more people in the space, like that's not true. So like going through your writings, some of the things I noticed were like time to utility. Like knowing who your customer was, you talked about on Tinder, how you were only looking at New York and LA at first when you're thinking about customers, but then you went beyond that. Um, you talked about the importance of notifications and almost becoming a habit in people's lives. So I'm curious, like, what are some little small things that crypto could do uh, to improve and actually become maybe more retail friendly? Yeah, so we, you're right, we invest across different industries, including crypto, and we've taken a, obviously a huge interest in the space. The benefit there is we get to see and i've seen a lot of um non-crypto products and what they do well and again i i always believe that there's learnings you can take from any um any part of the industry so it's helpful but the like the basic fundamental platforms and um and products we need to make crypto accessible i would say one is obviously mobile and so I think Frontech was interesting. The progressive web app, 
idea was, I thought, done very well um, for what is available. That said, if you put any non-crypto user in front of that onboarding experience, I would say I'd love to look at the completion rate because most people just aren't going to go through this kind of janky web experience. Again, I'm, I give credit for the, like, that's the best you can do with the App Store and Play Store. Um, not, I would say the Play Store is pro crypto now or getting more crypto friendly. The App Store clearly doesn't like crypto. Um, communication, I think, is, is obviously a huge part of what we need. And so XMTP or different communication protocols, like being able to have a conversation within a Web3 experience with another user. And the reason I say that is these things are all related. So you need mobile to facilitate push notifications. Push notifications are famously the best retention lever you can have as a any product, um, far better than email. And so you need you need mobile, you need push notifications, and communication has the highest open rate for any push notification you can send. There's actually two two communi- two push notification types that are the highest engagement. One is finance and one is communication. And so crypto has both uh, of those covered. And so I would think once we have mobile communication with push notifications, you could actually build fairly interesting products. Will people care? Like, I don't know the answer to that. That's the on the builders to figure out. But um, we're, I feel like we're playing from like, like crypto right now still feels like it's in the 2007 or or eight relative to where the rest of um, consumer experiences are. And so, um, so yeah, we have a long way to go. I am pretty excited. I did want to talk about, um, I'll I'll give Solana kind of a a plug because I, I do think that Helium launched last week was as close to what I think crypt, like a crypto go to market message should look like. Um, being if you looked at the any of the media placements, advertising, it it's the headline was five dollars unlimited phone plans, right? There was no mention of anything crypto related or deep in like all these words we use. It's just five dollars for a phone plan. And I I have a feeling if you were in living in Miami and you saw that on a, on a billboard, you would stop and, and try and figure out what, what the catch was or what they were selling, um, and, and take an interest. And I think that's what is, gets me excited. I, I was at, we were, I was an early investor in Dapper Labs. And I remember at the time people gave me a lot of shit in like crypto telegram groups. And they're like, how can you invest in a project that allows credit cards and um, doesn't allow self custody wallets. And I was kind of like, how, um, stubborn are you to not want people to experience NFTs for the first time? Right? Like if my dad wants to buy an NFT and use his credit card, why would we say to him? Like, we don't want you because you want to use your credit card. Um, I think the space is just, for me, that's where things have really fallen short. Um, is this like view that we can't learn from web two and take people down the path of decentralization if they choose. Like if, if my dad wants to buy a top shot and open up a MetaMask wallet and like really like embrace the deeper parts of, of the crypto experience, then that would be amazing. But I have a view it's more, more of like a progressive onboarding for most people. Yeah, I, I feel like that uh, five dollars unlimited data by healing is kind of like a thousand songs in your pocket. You know, with Steve Jobs, it's just like something that hits you without getting into the technicalities of it. Um, it's going to sell. I wanted to ask you not specifically about Dapper Labs because I know that was something that it's like a lot of people said it was more centralized, and there's debates about decentralization, how much that matters constantly on Twitter. Curious, like when you're looking at these different ecosystems, is that something that that comes up? Like when you have projects come to you, like how are they choosing where to build, and are you? Uh, basing how decentralized something as like Solana versus Ethereum versus an app chain. How much do you think of that? Um, we do, the answer is we think about it and we, we obviously view decentralization as being 
net positive for future applications. But I, I personally care way more about the user experience today and um, how we can meet people kind of where they are in their lives today and not force our personal ideologies or preferences on those people. And so when I look at Solana, when I first used Phantom for the first time two years ago, I'm sure you guys were doing the same thing. And you compare that to your experience using anything built on Ethereum, it was pretty clear what the better experience was. And this is not this is not me. Um, like, there's no ideology here. It's just let's just like take two people and put them in a room and have them transact on Solana and have them transact on Ethereum at that moment in time. And the one was a very better user experience. And that's kind of where I start and then try to figure out is there a risk with an experience being quote unquote centralized, which again, like Merd can probably explain better than anybody why Solana is like sufficiently decentralized. But um, to me, people start with their religion and then try and build the user experience that fits their preference for the world where most people just want things that are cheaper, faster, better. And if you step out of your little worldview and think about how a user experiences crypto for the first time, that's probably what they care about would be my take. Um, but again, I think it's, I wouldn't go to like a, I'm going to the Stanford blockchain conference today and I, I'm not going to get on a microphone and say that at, at that venue, but it's just kind of how I think the world works. And I'll give you one more example. We, um, we noticed we were having some like weird retention issues in India at Tinder. And it was because our onboarding flow was taking two to three seconds faster because we had a bug that had been introduced and people to a two to three second um, lag in our onboarding flow cause major retention issues within an entire country because people weren't willing to wait an extra two to three seconds. And so if you look at, at, at a lot of the products in Web3 today, I mean, how many, like, what is the, if we just look at it from like a purely performance and time spent on an onboarding flow, you can start to figure out what users might prefer. And um, again, I, I think Mert's probably been the loudest person online. So I, 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 I don't have to, uh, to convince you guys, I don't think. You said something that I think is really interesting that when you, you know, when you, when you backed Dapper Labs early on, and it's actually how most of my friends onboard the crypto, by the way, so clearly it at least worked somewhat, um, that people were like kind of against it or like in, in the TG chats, they were not very uh, supportive. Um, one thing I'm, you know, something I ask myself all the time is, is the lack of product success in crypto so far due to kind of the ideology around crypto and maybe like the academic nature of earlier proponents? Or is it that maybe there's just not that much utility? And uh, I ask this pretty frequently and I'm not too sure what the answer is. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think like maybe the inherent ideology of crypto leads to kind of worse products kind of almost by design, ironically? Or is it that there's maybe not that much use for it at the moment? Um, I think it depends on where you are in the world and kind of who, um, I was with a woman yesterday from Brazil and 50% of people in Brazil own a digital asset, mostly Bitcoin. And so she was talking about their, um, monetary policy and the issues they have there and why crypto is important for people on a daily basis in Latin America. And it, it just reminded me, like I was at Cyclops in San Francisco. Um, and if you were living in San Francisco today, like crypto probably doesn't have a ton of utility other than, you know, maybe you have some interest in, in, in more of the financial nature of, of investing crypto, but there's not like a, a need in your everyday life. I do think the um, probably some of the things happening in 
G pin to me are interesting because you start to take on like really large everyday use cases, transportation, telecom, food delivery, energy. Um, I think those can be a backdoor into, um, into mainstream adoption without forcing people to, to answer the question, like, do you care about crypto or does crypto help you in any way? Um, but yeah, I think, I think one of the things that, um, culturally was interesting to me in 2020 about crypto was like, there's just a lot more interest in becoming a part of the financial world, mostly as investors, like the Robin hood, um, came out obviously in like 2015 or so, but there's just a lot more interest in, in, in combining financial products with social experiences that I think could be really interesting and probably more, um, to me, like more fun than a lot of web two social products. But, um, yeah, the, the jury's out on us crypto and whether there's an everyday utility, um, so we'll see. I know there's a lot of interest in real world assets. Um, I know you, you actually, Nick Carter was on the show. I saw an interesting tweet yesterday where he said stable coins are product market fit in crypto. Like that was his take was we have product market fit with stable coins. Um, my litmus test, I lived in Kansas city when I started my tech career and kind of like when you go to non tech hubs do do people care to talk about crypto and um the answer is no they don't for the most part and so i think it's early to say that crypto has any mainstream utility um but that's okay because again it's still like relatively early in the experiment though Bert, i've seen your some of your tweets talking about how like the experiment's been running for quite a while um so you'd hope that we see that at some point yeah, I actually, um, so I'm, I'm in a hotel in Istanbul right now and saw one of the people with a board API club shirt. So, uh, you know, great utility there. So you just said you're quite like interested in Deepin and uh, same, I think it's a really interesting idea. Are there like, um, so let's maybe talk about verticals in crypto. Are there any verticals you think are underrated in crypto? Um, I know like some people like are super either bearish on gaming or like bullish, but like, what do you, what do you think about the different verticals like payments, DeFi, et cetera? Yeah, I think um, I personally like haven't given up on the idea of um, NFTs being a great primitive for community formation and in kind of alignment around owning something together. Like probably the most interesting exper experiments in the last bull market were, um, and if you've seen like Archive, they're building, you can co-own a museum together and choose what art you purchase and um you own a physical product in the real world um obviously you, you probably sell links now etc like i haven't given up on this idea of um of like groups of people owning co-owning physical assets in the real world i think that's <clears throat> pretty interesting to me tougher in a in a bear market where everybody's feeling a bit poor to um to convince people to, to participate in these crazy ideas um, we are spending a lot of time in, in deep and we also, we were investors in Ondo finance, which, um, is kind of leading parts of the RWA, um, at least by volume, they've become one of the emerging startups in, in that ecosystem. But yeah, we're, um, I wouldn't say we have any specific vertical right now that's interesting to us, but we are way more interested in applications than infrastructure would be one piece because I think our view is that the infrastructure is like sufficient at this point to, um, to run most of these experiments and see if people care. Um, because again, like one of the things I've, I've seen in my career is like, if people really want something, they see value, they will, um, like they will, they will work pretty hard to get through some of the, the, it's a little counter to what I was saying earlier, but at least with early adopters, like they'll go through some crap to, to, to try a product if, 
the rewards great enough. And so, um, yeah, the infrastructure, the infrastructure investing right now, I think is, um, kind of a retreat to like safety. And, um, I don't think that's what's needed right now for crypto to succeed. And you mentioned Dapper Labs and Top Shot. I know I remember, you know, at that time, that was like the hottest thing in the space. Like to this day, I think it's still reached like normies probably more than any other project. Is there anything that you think, like if a project came to you similar to Top Shot today, like would you invest? Is there anything that maybe you think they did wrong or something that we've learned since then that would make that sustainable? Yeah, I think probably what they did right was recognize that intellectual property is a great shortcut to adoption with any um, product. It could be technology products. I'm sure, I don't know if you guys have seen the Barbie movie yet, but uh, yeah. like Barbie, <laughs> the Barbie franchise has been around for, I don't know, 50 plus years and did over a billion dollars in box office revenue um, already. And I know people at Mattel and they've been sitting on that IP for 30 years, trying to think about how they can make a movie. Um, and so I think Top Shots really understood that leveraging existing interests in, in this case, sports primarily was a great shortcut to bring in normies into crypto. I think, I don't know, we haven't, we've obviously seen like a ton of, of different pitches that have that mindset, but it feels like we always try and create new things in crypto, um, with generative art or, um, especially within like the PFP world and maybe like going back to that shortcut could be interesting and saying, Hey, that gives a really interesting known IP we can leverage to bring people back into the space. And, um, I don't know the, I don't know if we'd invest in another like dapper type of project right now, because frankly, like we feel like we made that bet a couple of years ago and we're still waiting to see how, um, how it plays out. But we are, we are interested broadly in the utility that NFTs can provide to community formation and, um, view it as being a, uh, as Mert said, like a pretty good way to bootstrap a early community. So while we're on the topic of products, this is going to be not related to crypto, but it, I'm really curious on, on your thoughts here, Jeff. I was listening to a talk by Keith from Founders Fund, um, and he he said something like, the advice that you should talk to your users as a product manager is actually like backwards. Like he thinks of building products as almost like um, creating a movie, right? Like you don't ask yeah. a lot of people on the street, like, hey, what movie do you want to see? You instead, you know, just build a, or, you know, create the movie. And then obviously the common wisdom is to talk to your users, iterate and whatnot. How do you like, obviously you're a big product. Like, what are your thoughts on that? How, how should people think about building product? Yeah, that's probably like a very Steve Jobs mindset. Like your users don't know what they want type of, um, which I think is, is largely true in consumer. It's hard to imagine what the next great consumer experience would look like for the best product people. And so to ask a user what that might be, I think in B2B SaaS or enterprise products, you normally can go to a customer and be like, Hey, if we added like, I don't know, if we were like SOC 2 compliant, like, would you buy this product? And they'd, they'd tell you yes or no, or, um, kind of like the that's why I, I don't actually build SaaS or enterprise products myself because it's often, it's often like very, um, it can be like a lit formulaic as to what that path looks like. But for consumer, I, I would largely agree. I would say anyone who has like really strong takes on how to build consumer products, it's kind of like self-help books. Like everybody has like a different, um, idea on what it takes and nobody Nobody really knows, um, as like, I, I've worked with, I think some of the best product people in consumer software and, you know, Sean Arad at Tinder, Jonathan Bedeen, like all these guys, like it is hard to know what is going to work. And the way Tinder found its its success was they ran a bunch of experiments and stumbled upon dating as being 
the original Tinder product was a networking app that the swipes, the cards were supposed to be business cards. And then they're like, this isn't working for business. So let's try dating. And overnight, like they're like, holy shit, this is like, this definitely is working. Um, but it wasn't like, it wasn't something that you could read in a book or users could tell you is just a lot of experiments. And, um, so yeah, I see, I see a lot of consumer founders who come in and pitch ideas. Like they know, they know what the outcome's going to be. And the truth is nobody ever knows. And the best people I've invested in just take a very, um, they're very low ego, but high, high, like high builder energy, but low ego, um, is what we look for. So people who, um, uh, we invest in this company called captions. It's not a web three product, but it's basically when you watch like any video on TikTok or Twitter now, and there's captions on the short form video, they're probably providing those captions. And they were the experiments team at Snap that built, they built over a hundred consumer experiences at Snap and captions, which is now really taken off was like their six idea they tried at this company and but their mindset's just like ship things, move on. Like another thing consumer founders do a lot is they're like, they like call you and they're like, do I have product market fit? And you're like, come on, like you, you will know when you have product market fit because like, you'll just look at your data in the morning. You'll be like, this is growing faster than, than we can keep up with. And there was no explanation as to why that's happening often. It's just like it catches the right cultural moment and takes off in a really it's it's something you just can't explain and so um anyways that's probably one of my favorite questions it's like if you call me if you call me and ask if i if you're a park mark fit like the you answer don't. is just no so don't don't call <laughs> <laughs> yeah i liked your point on experimentation too i know you, i maybe you had a tweet on this you're talking about like how you found like what to charge at tinder and obviously you guys found something people wanted going from business cards to dating everyone wants to go on dates everyone wants to make money which is like crypto why speculation is so good <laughs> And I saw you were experimenting with like, what do we charge here? And you started with $9.99 for some subscription tier. And people are like, you're crazy. No one's going to pay that. Well, it did. And then you charged like $39.99 a month for Twitter gold. And, and that was like your highest grossing product ever. So just like experimentation, trying it out. And if you find something people like, you'll pay for it. Um, something that you talk about often is like finding uh, when you're looking at founders is their earned secret. Um, I'm curious if maybe explain that, but I'm, what do you think your earned secret is that puts you as, mm. you know, you're in, you're investing in crypto and, and web three, but like you could quit any day and be the head of product to any company. So I'm just curious, like what puts you, what is an earned secret? And like, what puts you in this position to want to be here and, and invest in this space? Yeah. So, uh, the, the earned secret idea is actually something a guy named Mike Maples taught me who's at Bloodgate, but it's like, if you were to. Like, let's start with like Garrett and Mert when you're like five years old and look at your entire life story. Where are you, what were you, what were you interested in as a kid? Kind of what were your hobbies? What do you study in high school? What do you sit in college? What were your jobs that didn't work? What were the jobs that did work? And like success and heartbreak along the way that have informed your point of view on the world that all lead to this idea that you have discovered through a lot of um, combined life experiences that make you the one of one person to solve any given problem in the world. And so it's kind of a, um, uh, an exercise of trying to really be introspective and self-aware around kind of like what your unique gift is in the world that allows you to see some problem and solution differently than everybody else. Um, and so that's pretty, it's a pretty like heavy, um, way of looking at, at, at kind of like your life arc and trying to identify what you're uniquely su suited to do in either tech or anything else to create value in the world. It's a pretty drawn out process. It's actually very hard in the crypto like bull market to ever even have this conversation with anybody because you had 20 minutes to 
be on a Zoom call with somebody. And if I was to take like 20 minutes and ask Mert about the person who broke his heart in high school or whatever, like <laughs> he'd probably, he'd probably <laughs> like hang up the, the call. Um, but yeah, it's, and so I think for uh, me, I'm, I, I don't know if I have like that answer today. I think when I was at Tinder, the, um, I was pretty good at building dating products because I um, had like a long journey to, I'm not married, but um, like I went through the craziest ups and downs in relationships. I was single for a long time. I used okay cupid i used every dating product imaginable like i knew that product very well um i don't think that's like my my purpose in the world but i think i was uniquely suited as the vp of product there to build some pretty great products within that category because i had just been a customer for so long of of, of different dating products and so um when we meet founders i want to figure out like how we always call it the idea maze. Like, have you gone through the idea maze of like every twist and turn of an idea to try and figure out what the right entry point to market is and um, trying to figure out like how the depth of the founder on what they're trying to build. Um, so yeah. And then in terms of my life journey, like I actually had a pretty non-traditional path and adventure and, um, after I was an English major, I went to film school after out to USC film school when I was 22, tried to be a screenwriter, like know how hard the creative process is and took those learnings and applied it to building software. Um, but anything like that involves creators or like that group of people, like I've experienced the ups and downs of 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 that world um and tried to make it and ha- and failed pretty pretty bad um and so i think i just have like a point of view on like what the life of a struggling artist feels like and have applied that to to investing um yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's <laughs> really, no i love the answer i love the answer i love that you went to film school too you went from that to getting into product well i think you went from you were living in san francisco and you moved all the way to kansas city um, I'm from Arkansas, mm-hmm. so I can like relate to that area of the world nice. a bit. You know, one thing that I actually think this outside of crypto is like it would help founders if they actually like get out and um, maybe speak to people and see other people in part of the world. Because like when I go from like I'm in New York, if I go from New York to Arkansas, like you, you learn that there's a whole other world out there. And sometimes maybe like the people you're building for, you realize like that's such a small contingent of your future users. Um, and you, I think that probably benefited you a lot, seeing like people in California to go into Kansas City. Um, maybe on one thing that I saw you tweet, and I think this is like really um, positive for builders in the space. You said that right now in 2023, with all the platform shifts that we're seeing, that this is maybe the best vintage of, uh, I, I think it's a platform shifts or products that, that you're seeing as an investor and builder right now. And you talked about like AR and VR. Um, so I'm curious if you can just expand on that, because I think that's like a really powerful message for people that right now are like kind of doom and gloom, you know, bear market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think we... Um you in your career hope that you can be a part of maybe like two to three platform shifts as a founder and if you're lucky you'll get to build a product that catches that that wave at the right moment in time and i think the um at least like 2016 to 2020 um especially at the application layer we're pretty you know crypto is exciting but um, it was like a pretty boring set of problems to solve. And I think we, we reached on the mobile still, still going, it's not going anywhere, but like, I feel like the, the big categories were like solved for, and then we, we looked at crypto as being maybe like the next, um, platform shift. And suddenly I think while crypto is still, um, one of those places to build, you have the Apple Vision Pro coming out, which, you know, I would think based on Apple's track record that that will have some level of success. I'm not sure what it will look like, but you have AR, VR, you have crypto, you have AI, which is an incredible place to build consumer applications right now because 
people are so eager to try anything AI related. Um, and then on the other side of the, the spectrum, you have, I think, a lot of really interesting um, products within defense tech space. Like there's just like a huge spectrum of, of categories that you can build in. Whereas I feel like maybe like five years ago, it's like, okay, are you building a mobile app or a B2B product? And that was kind yeah. of like the, the, the range of, of companies. So exactly. yeah, I think like one thing I would say to people in crypto, and it's probably not like the, um, the message everybody says is it's okay to experiment with ideas outside of crypto too for a period of time, or it's okay to take your interest in crypto and combine that with another category and see like what the petri dish of, of, of like ideas, like what, what you can create with that. Um, I think there's a mentality in crypto. If somebody were to like go try something that wasn't squarely within crypto, they're almost like, it's like they're like pushed out of the community. Um, but maybe it's maybe like building something within another sector and then combining your your background in crypto, like maybe that creates the next best product that creates the new bull market, if that makes sense. Um, and so I think right now in a bear market, like the yeah. stakes are pretty low in a good way where you can go like try some crazy ideas and see what um what you create and i would encourage people to take a very broad view of what that might be what are your thoughts on let's say you're you know a company building on chain x and you go multi-chain to get more users um or maybe you go cross-chain what are are your thoughts on that do you think like because there's two schools of thoughts on this or thought on this which is like well, maybe one, you actually want to get users outside of crypto. That should be the main goal. Yeah. Or, you know, you get users that are power users on the other chains first. Like, What, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I know probably like the best example I have seen and obviously has had different reactions would be D-Gods. And um, their view is that every chain has a unique user base and to really expand your project like you should be thinking of ways to go cross chain so you can reach as many people as possible um i think Mert, the i don't have um as much religion towards any chain as as i think um other people in the space and so from a business strategy perspective, I think that is an interesting idea, um, which is like, Hey, again, maybe we'll, maybe we'll like go back to web two. Would you release a mobile app on iOS and you have international users on Android devices and not build for those people? Like, um, you probably like the business strategy would probably be like, Hey, let's, let's think about how we can build an Android application too. And so, um, I don't know if that, if like that, if if you guys agree with that, but I think from a, um, I think there are business reasons why that makes sense. And, um, I think the, the narrative is what is more challenging is like, if you build on Solana first and you go to the Ethereum ecosystem and like, are you, is that you saying, hey, Solana is not a great place to build an NFT project? Um, I don't think that should be the takeaway of the message, but often that's what is the, like, that's what I see on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I don't have strong views on what's right versus wrong, other than I think from a, like, addressable market perspective that does end up, um, for some projects being a reality, like what, happens when you saturate any given chain and you need to grow your audience um, like where do you go to find new users and um i think different ecosystems have different types of users and you know the view on some chains is that they're harder to monetize than others and so that's another part of the the, the 
kind of the conversation too. Yeah, and r- related to that, I think it's difficult now with, with Ethereum, you used to just have like Ethereum L1. Like if you launch on Ethereum, you know where everybody's going. Um, and now you have, you know, rollups and they're all frameworks and L1s, L2s, L3s. Um, and then distribution in some ways becomes a problem. Um, obviously right now, crypto is all about liquidity. And I, I, to me, at least, that's something that like Solana, for example, has in its favor. Obviously, some other ecosystems do too. And that like, if you're a builder and you want to go to an ecosystem, it's like you build there on Solana, on L1. Whereas today, like Mert's talking about going cross-chain, but like, where do you go? And eventually, yeah. like, you're only going to be able to support so many places. It'd be like if you had to build for like 20 different operating systems, not just iOS and Android. Um, I, yeah, how do you think, maybe this is almost the same answer. How do you think about the importance of distribution and like maybe owning that customer touch point. And, and by that, I mean like you're the front end and the customer knows who you are. Like they know Uniswap and Uniswap is building a wallet um, versus, you know, depend. I don't know where distribution even goes because we don't have an app store in crypto right now. You have, you know, Backpack and Solana and so forth. But how do you think about distribution and the importance of maybe owning that customer, you know, relationship? Um, yeah, I think there's, two parts of one is distribution from like a top of the funnel go to market it's like do you have the ability to successfully onboard people into your application get them to sign up and then the second part of it is do you have some like do you have the communication channels or retention hooks maybe it's through some identity that you own to um continue that relationship and I've learned in my career that distribution um I've been like very stubborn to reach this conclusion but distribution is more important than product in most cases um and you can build the best product ever but if nobody is aware of it or sees it um it's just never gonna succeed and so I think there's ways to build virality within products that maybe can can earn more distribution um but that's why you see incumbents um most often win in consumer social because they have distribution advantages that are very hard for a startup to overcome the um within crypto i don't think anybody has like a real distribution advantage outside of coinbase um and maybe maybe like MetaMask because they have what 26 million yeah. active wallets or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't know if Uniswap has a distribution advantage, but they have a brand awareness advantage, which is very hard to, um, to beat. And so when I looked at, at like brand awareness, their market share of, um, their market share is comparable to, to Pepsi or Coke. Um, with which which is pretty amazing to me, and so without owning a user, like I don't think Uniswap knows that I use Uniswap, or if they do, they've never communicated with me. Like I just think to go to Uniswap when um, when I want to execute a swap or, or or kind of like everyday trading. Um, so yeah, it's it's something that's that that I think is is hard to do in crypto right now, and um, it's almost like the more decentralize you want your project to become like at the core of that is trying to level the playing field of within distribution um and own like own users less than yeah. more centralized products and so it's, it, it is i think this is all part of like the larger question around like um like is it possible to build a, a huge sustainable business while um while you know, being more decentralized as a, um, as a go to market. So one thing or two things I'm super curious about, uh, Jeff, you're, you're a really good writer. Uh, I, for this show, I read literally every single one of your posts, or at least like a good amount of them. And, um, I'm, you know, as for people who want to be better writers, like I'm curious on like maybe, uh, some writing tips that you might have. And two, um, obviously you are a great product mind and I am curious with the lack of crypto products uh, out there what is one thing that you hope people take away from you know maybe product thinking from web 2 that they can apply to web 3 products yeah um i'll start with number one i 
I started my career in screenwriting, which I mentioned earlier. And if you read a screenplay, it's like ev- ev- every word is there for a reason. There's like no wasted um, verbiage or words. It's very punchy. And so I try to write um, like a screenplay and really the um, you need to come up with a hook that people care about. And really within screenplays, you have people who read screenplays for, li- for, for a living. And you need to grab their attention on the first page. Um, otherwise, they literally like throw your script in a garbage can and move on to the next one because the the kind of the filter of, of what they need to do is um, reading does. Like I've been this person who reads scripts, and so um, I kind of view writing as being like coming up with a hook and then um, really like grabbing people's attention within the first paragraph or two. And, and trying to convince them to spend more time with whatever you're trying to, to communicate. Um, writing tips would, I think, just be like, whatever the voice in your head is, try to write like that voice and try to make it as conversational as possible and to not think about having the perfect um, sentence. Like, just like try to write like you're writing to your best friend or, or in a journal, and people will prefer that to like fancy stylistic writing, at least from what I've seen. Um, in terms of consumer products in web two, I think, uh, I always like love thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, you know, like what do people actually need or want in their lives? They want love to shelter security, um, and trying to like really take it back to the core of what people are trying to do to achieve whatever they're trying to, to achieve in this world. So self-actualization, I think, is is a huge part of what makes products succeed. Um, some of it's pretty vain, but, you know, like, this is a world we live in. And so um, I would try for crypto products to really think about, like, what are Web2 products that have worked in um what like why did they actually work not because they were built on some technology stock it was like the visceral reaction of downloading tinder for the first time like really got people excited like it was like holy shit like i have hundreds of people who i can now connect with and um it's like a a map like that like moment or like you guys probably remember when you used uber for the first time it's like these magic moments where you're providing people with a shortcut in the world to enable them to live a a better easier happier life um and if crypto can't do that then it's probably not going to be more than these financial use cases which are also interesting but these aren't like i don't think like world changing um applications if we can't bring it out yeah that's a great answer i remember reading this book called um well it's by rory sutherland um and it's about like behavioral um economics and it, it talks about uber and i think one thing that's interesting and i don't know where this applies in crypto yet but you eventually see it coming in even though uber by and far is a better product than just having a taxi he's like in some sense it's the it's the little things that are more psychological that actually make a big difference in a product and for example it's like calling your uber you can see how far away it is and it might be 15 minutes away. When you call a cab, it might be 10. But just by giving that like screen where you can see where it is, you have that certainty. And that's a 10 times improvement. So it's like sometimes we're probably trying to improve like a quantitative measure when there are these qualitative community aspects of products that we could we could build on crypto as well. But um, dude, Jeff, this was this was amazing. Um <laughs> been pumped for this conversation. This is uh kind of nerdy, but you should definitely go back and read his his tweets as well. Uh, just packed with information. I think everybody in crypto needs to including myself, need to know more about product because that will be the only reason we'll ever get out of uh, this bear market. So <laughs> thanks thanks so much for joining today. Yeah, of course. And we will get out of the bear market. So everybody like, uh, like there's, there, there's light at the end of the road. So I, I, I would be excited to have this conversation in a couple of years when things look, uh, look more positive. And thanks for providing this to the community. Yeah, amazing. Thanks for coming on and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys.